Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Marketplace Discussions podcast. My name is Mahmoud Resmi, and today's guest is Gregory Sadler. After a career as a fairly traditional academic, teaching and publishing in philosophy, religious studies, and critical thinking, Gregory decided to transition into the entrepreneurial world, providing public and client-focused work. He is the founder of Reason.io, a company that provides philosophical counseling services, as well as executive coaching and ethics consulting. In addition, Gregory has a popular YouTube channel with 135,000 subscribers and over 2,500 videos. I hope you enjoy today's discussion. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below if you're on YouTube or to reach out to me at DecafQuest on Twitter. If you enjoyed the episode, uh, please click on the subscribe button and thank you very much for listening. Uh, we're I'm I'm on Central Time because I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. So just north of Chicago, about an hour and a half. And right now it's ten o three, so still morning oh. time for me. Yeah, it's uh, it's five p.m. here uh, in Spain, Salamanca, and I think it's uh, eleven Eastern. And yeah, you're that's starting right. an Aristotle uh, course tomorrow. Yeah, it starts tomorrow uh at well this time my time yeah 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 how uh, uh yeah let's uh start maybe with uh introducing uh who you are and what you do because i jumped right into the aristotle course so first off uh gregory thank you very much uh for joining me today on the marketplace discussions podcast i am a huge fan oh, uh, i came across thanks. your videos way back and i i actually forgot the the year because i was a master's student in 2012. i did not major in philosophy i only minored graduated 2010 i think you joined youtube right around that time maybe 2011 yeah uh so i i came across your work i i did one year of uh a gap year in salamanca where i studied spanish and then i did my masters 2011 2012 and that was i think where uh, your courses started kind of being helpful or your videos basically you were recording videos of your philosophy courses and uploading them on on youtube so it's it's really good to have you here today because i I was watching your videos X years ago and then for my PhD and then all of a sudden we're having a discussion here. So that's that's always nice. Uh, yeah. So you're a philosophy professor. Tell us about yourself a bit. Well, I I can list myself, I suppose, formally as a philosophy professor because I have a weird rank at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, which is adjunct full professor. <laughs> they, they, uh, <laughs> you know, so an, okay. So, so an adjunct is somebody who's not full time, right? It's somebody who gets hired sometimes only semester to semester. At at my ad, fortunately, we have you know expectation of getting hired back e each term. But they have ranks that go from adjunct lecturer to adjunct assistant professor all the way to to full. And when I get hired, um, I had so many years of of teaching that they just put me in there at the highest level. So I'm kind of a professor, but kind of not. I, I've been a a professor before full time at other places, and you know when you're mentioning those videos, I was I was working as an adjunct as well at Marist College. Uh, so I do that, and then I really it's about it's going more than ten years back. I've got my own business, and so I produce you know you mentioned the videos there's podcast episodes writing i work with clients um sometimes just you know regular people who want to do philosophical counseling and work on their their issues or tutorials but all the way up to like uh doing executive coaching with ceos and other c-suite people and then i do a, you know a good bit of public speaking and I'm sure I'm leaving something. Oh, I offer online courses. And so I, I keep pretty busy, you know? So there's there's the, we could call it the old school professional philosophy side. And then there's the more uh, 21st century innovative 
kind of business oriented side, although I have to admit I'm terrible at marketing. <laughs> so. uh, I, I'm not so sure about terrible at marketing, but you're definitely a pioneer in the domain. You've been posting uh, YouTube videos like you've you've gone all digital, I think way before anyone else, like maybe others have been. Yeah, doing it, but yeah. Then it's like to, to choose uh, around 2010, 11 to start uploading your your lectures on YouTube. That's that is innovative in and of itself. Before we get into the philosophy consulting business, which I'm also interested yeah. in. But yeah, well, how how did you end up well, doing that? So there is a story there that will make you think I'm not quite so innovative and progressive. <laughs> my wife was the one who talked me into it when she wasn't my wife, but just my fiance. She is very into, you know, developing technologies. And, and back then she was actually an assistant dean of educational technology at the Culinary Institute of America. And she had bought me a flip cam, you know, one of those little tiny, and they were actually called flip. There was a company called flip before they went out of business. And she bought me one for sort of chronicling my trips with my kids. I'd recently gotten divorced. And so we had, you know, summer vacation. And then she said, you know, you could actually record lectures in your classes. This is kind of a new thing that people are doing. It's called lecture capture. And I was like, ah, yeah, I guess I could do that. You know, it seems like a, a little bit of extra work. And then I thought about it and I was like, well, I do have a lot of students who miss classes and it would be nice for them to be able to go back to it. So she talked me into doing it. And then she was like, put them on YouTube. And I was like, who the hell's going to watch me? I'm a nobody, you know? And so I, I did that with uh, the university that I was at at the time called Fayetteville State University. And those were these critical thinking lectures, which I don't actually own. They, they own those because at that time, you may remember this, YouTube would only allow you to upload like 10 minutes at a time and then 15 minutes and then 20 minutes. But if you had an institutional account, you could upload entire class sessions. So they have all of those. And then when I moved up to New York to be with my fiance, now wife, Andy, um, and I started recording at Marist, I, I asked them, hey, can I record lectures? And they were like, do what? And I said, you know, like uh, put a video camera down in class and just record what I'm doing and saying. And they're like, oh, I don't know about that. And I was like, that's ah, good for the students. You know, they can go back to it over time. And again, I had no idea that a lot of other people would be watching it. But as it turned out, in part because there weren't many people doing it. Um, you know, a lot of people would watch the lectures and then say, you know, it was interesting, some of the comments. Um, the worst comments in one respect were people saying, my professor won't explain anything. So thanks for explaining, you know, Aristotle's metaphysics or Descartes, um, you know, meditations because uh, otherwise I was going to flunk my class. And that's terrible, right? <laughs> so, and then there were others who were saying things like, you know, I can't afford to go to college or I've been out of college for a while. It's nice to watch these lectures because it's like being in college again. And then there were other people who were either like in your, in your case, using them to, you know, supplement what they were studying already. Right. So it just kind of grew. And, uh, you know, when you get good feedback from people, it makes it easier to keep on doing something. I think if everyone had like weighed in and been like, Sadler, you suck, you know, maybe I wouldn't have kept up with it. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if, if you were receiving maybe because the the comments you mentioned i mean on the one hand they might be bad because of their experiences in, yeah. at their universities but then did you receive any kind of hater comments on on youtube oh, and the reason why i'm yeah, asking yeah. that is uh, i'm comparing it to what would it, things have been if you were maybe posting them also on twitter nowadays right with all the trolling yeah that's a good comments. example how 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 was it like the the hate yeah i i mean i, I you, you would get occasional things that are just totally unconnected to what you're saying. And, and, you know, they're basically amounting to, I hate you, you suck, go away. And so I would just, I just delete those and then block those people because 
I look at my my social media and my YouTube channel as sort of like being my front porch. You can hang out there, but if you're not civil, then I kick you out because I, it's my place, so I don't have to put up with that. And then, you know, I mean, we could actually do like an entire episode about the goofy comments that you get and you probably get quite a few of these too especially on on twitter and because you like to poke <laughs> the philosophy people so you, you get a lot of people who think that they're they're going to correct you about what you've got wrong about nietzsche or kant or pick whoever else and it's usually almost always they've got something wrong, but they're totally convinced that you're the one who's got it wrong. So they'll write a really long rant about this or that. And, you know, I, again, I, I often, I, in the past, I used to try to engage those people, but then I realized pretty quickly, they're not, they're not good faith interlocutors. So I just delete and block. And then, you know, I've, I've had quite a few ideological things. Um, it's interesting in the early Trump years here in America, racists began feeling quite emboldened. And because I have a family last name that happens to be Jewish, even though it's not my family's original name, our original, on my father's side, the original name was Skufka because my grandfather was Slovenian, but he changed it to Sadler because he wanted to get ahead in business here in the United States. And being a Slav at that time was, you know, going to be a problem. So I'd have people weighing in and saying, look at his Jewish face. You know, you can tell right off the bat with his nose or things like that. And, you know, you'd get weird crap like that. Um, and you know, I think there's probably a whole bunch of other, we could classify the other weird things that people say. I do get a lot of people, so I, I created some videos that are like frequently asked questions videos because I was getting so many comments of certain sorts, like people ask me something that they should just go to Google for, you know? And so I created a video about that, just do a search, or I have people who are clearly <laughs> trying to, um, especially around this time of the year, uh, use my channel to get me to do their homework for them or give them answers to test questions. So I created a video for that, or I get a lot of people giving me advice about what video content I should produce next. And so I say, well, it's nice that you're interested in the channel, but um, if you want me to stop doing what I'm doing and do your thing, you can pay me to do that. You can commission a video. And I actually... To be fair, I've had a few people who have put their money where their mouth is on Heidegger and Nietzsche stuff. Um, it's funny because the, the most requested thing is Spinoza. Won't you do some videos on Spinoza? And I'll be like, sure, yeah, if you want me to stop you know, my schedule and like shift it to do your thing, go ahead and hire me and I'll do it. Nobody ever wants to put up the money for it. <laughs> Uh, yeah and this is this is in fact interesting i mean you're you're solving problems uh in in a philosophical kind of way these these videos are uh definitely you're you're basically trolling people as well like they they're trolling you you troll them with with uh more videos you're talking about on my twitter right uh yeah yeah uh twitter and you know uh the do a google search video i mean that's oh right yeah uh not not the actual philosophical content but um the the philosophy also in in terms of maybe not necessarily hate but the pushback that you might get have you ever mm. been um told going back to the people who uh were trying to correct you or who would correct you uh, maybe also about your teaching style did you have comments about that because oh yeah yeah you like uh, to make your your at least your college university courses highly interactive uh, you try to kind of make the material relatable to the students and this is where oh, i was also inspired by you because i was using the videos for my courses when I was teaching. And so mm. it's it's always been inspiring to me because I it, it's like, this is the kind of philosophy I want to be doing, right? So have you yeah. gotten any any pushback on that? I'm, I'm curious. You know, the pushback that I've gotten has mainly been people, and it's, and it's kind of rare, but they'll say, oh, this is too simple. You know, this is, yeah. this is at a beginner level. And I'll say, well, these are beginner classes, you know, intro to philosophy, uh, ethics for, for non-majors. Um, and I think there's a kind of, 
there's an elitism there that's not really based. Some elitisms can be based in something where you genuinely deserve to be in an elite and then you know make judgments. But I think when it comes to a lot of academic matters, the elitism is kind of hollow. And it's more about feeling like you're in a, you know, a class of intelligentsia or, or intellectuals and everybody else is kind of, you know, a, a wasting your time. And I don't look at doing philosophy that way. And I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that, that you don't either going by all, all the things I've seen you say that, um, you know, it's something that we should be willing to share widely. And if, if the philosophy when we're teaching it can't connect with non-philosophers, students who could be in business or fashion design or nursing, then that's our problem. You know, we have to be the ambassadors for the discipline. And I, and I do like to make, you're right. I like the lectures to be really interactive. It's boring when just to get up and lecture, you know, I mean, I guess you could say that a lot of my videos that are not in classrooms are, are me doing just that. But I try to think as I'm looking at the camera in my room all by myself, what would somebody who hasn't read this text and is interested in this, how would I reach them? You know, And I think that's, uh, th that's not the only possible take you could take in philosophy, but I think that's maybe one of the most productive. And I remember being a student and sitting in classes and being bored out of my mind at some lecturer, usually some old guy just droning on and on, and on right? or at conferences, at hearing conferences the same kind of thing. Are, are the worst as well, because you'd expect like maybe a course, if, <laughs> if you know, yeah. a professor has been there for 30, 50 years, you'd, you'd be like, okay, fine. Uh, I mean, they he's doing his thing. But at conferences, yeah. it's like you're there to kind of communicate what you're, uh, what yeah, you're exactly. or your findings or what you're writing about and then it becomes just boring and uh, and get people interested and and of course asking questions that are kind of from left field if you don't mind me going off on a tangent i'll tell you about yeah a, yeah sure 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 so i i had a colleague and he was a pretty cool guy he was a bit older than me an english guy and he would, we would go to conferences together. This is when I was at Fayetteville State University. He was also in the philosophy department and there was money for going to conferences. So we would like, you know, sign up and go, you know, to this Neoplatonist conference. And the first couple of times that I saw him talking about stuff, it was really engaging. He, he was, he was somebody who was also an actor, like you know, doing local theater performance. So he was really good. But then it turned me off when I saw him basically telling the same stories in the same way at the same times in his presentation. Because the first couple of times you feel like it's genuine and not rehearsed and it's it's revealing something of this person and their love for the topic or something like that. But after you've heard it like three or four times, you're like, oh, this is just a shtick. This is this is a can't, you know, and it it completely ruined the ethos of that for me. I mean, I still liked him as a person, but there was always that that sense of something having been lost, you know? How how do you I I completely kind of agree with you and that yeah. it would it it does turn me off when it comes to just, you know, uh, recounting the same stories. And I've thought about this quite a lot. Uh, especially uh, with regard to people who are uh, like, you know, the the uh, famous people who go on talks right, right. here and there, right? And then they maybe are at a certain point when they, where they don't have enough time to come up with new stories. So they cannot research. Yeah. So this is this is at least the, the justification I, I would give as to why they repeat the same stories. But how how would you combat that? How do you combat that? Because I've also been struggling myself. It's like, how can I just approach things, the same thing, but differently? Because we're teaching the same courses. We're teaching, yeah. you know. I mean, I do sometimes tell the same story, but I don't tell it in the same way. And that's maybe one way around it. I'm not using rehearsed language. And, and you're right. If you are like, if you've made it big, you probably don't have enough time to develop a lot of new stuff and you're you're probably going to get a little stale because you're not getting enough time to keep on reading 
The other, I mean, the other thing I've got working for me is that if you have a wide range of matters that you're engaging with, you're probably not going to have the chance to get stale like that, you know? So I used to teach a lot of classes uh, for a lot of different institutions. And then I'd also shoot videos and, you know, do, do other speaking things. And so I would just keep making up new stuff. I mean, making up is probably the wrong word because really, really what I'm doing most of the time is I'm taking somebody else's ideas and then presenting them in a way that's accessible. I'm not, I'm not coming up with any radical new theories or concepts or approaches of my own, you know, every once in a while I'll coin a phrase like ontological dignity and talking about Anselm, but usually those don't catch on. <laughs> so I don't have you to never know that. when, when you'd get lucky and it, it that's true. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. it. It's completely luck. You know, uh, so much of this is, is just a matter of like being in the right place at the right time, I would say. <laughs> so, Which but is... it, yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me. Well, I was going to say, there's an interesting analogy. As you were bringing up the the big names that do that sort of thing, I was thinking about like in, in terms of bands. So if you're, if you're a great band, um, you've probably been playing for a long time coming up in, in clubs and things like that. So you've perfected, you've got your cover tunes that you've been doing, and then you've got your your original material and then suddenly you you get your first album out and people are like holy shit this is amazing i'm gonna go see them let me get a t-shirt you know and they tell all their friends about it and then the real challenge is um your second record because generally you've only got you know six months to to actually produce it and you're on tour and you've already used up your good song ideas so you've got to come up with some new song ideas right you can't just keep doing the same old thing and if your new record is too much like the first record, then people are going to be like, ah, oh, they they don't really, um, they don't have much range. I mean, unless you're ACDC or somebody like that. But if it's too different, then they're like, yeah, this is not the same band anymore. And then, you know, once you get going and you get to like your seventh, eighth album, and now like you're a big thing, like say Iron Maiden, right? And you're on tour all over the place all the time. Um, there's a tendency to just go back to the hits. And actually I have a friend who he's, he's the guy that I used to do the classic metal class with, and we're hoping to start resuming it again, Scott Cerulli. He's a guitar professor and, and practicing musician. And so he goes to a lot more gigs and he hates it when he walks in and he sees the bands just playing the old hits from the seventies and eighties, right. Rather than like supporting their, their new album. And he, he calls them out publicly on, on Facebook about that sometimes. And I think he's right, you know, but there is this, this tendency to like stick to what, you know, the audience is going to like rather than confront them with something radically new. Now, certain bands can get away with that much more easily. Like if you're a tool, you know, uh, people come to your your stuff and they expect that the next album is going to be different than than the last one. But if you're, I mean, to take the other extreme, if ACDC were to produce an album where suddenly they go progressive, everyone would be like, what the hell is this crap? <laughs> so. Yeah. And I, I don't know if this is this is also similar to, to maybe uh, stand up comedians, but I and and this. New oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and in praise of the process, because I did write curiously uh, an article about this four or five weeks ago or no, maybe two months ago. Yeah, or, or something, whatever, or like uh, uh, not so long ago. And it was about yeah. this in praise of the process. And I was comparing it to my stuff as well, like my classes. Yeah. So if I am. And, and comparing it with university professors who also stick to the same thing and they just regurgitate it yeah. uh, without without coming up with new material. And I was trying to think about the reasons why this happens. Like in my case, I'm teaching online courses. So I, my margin of error here is like I cannot just uh, present or launch a course and then 
try to come up with new material on the go or try out new material like the comedians yeah. do with with stand-up comedy they go to comedy clubs they have new jokes they're working uh with they're trying to come up with new material so they test it out there in my case now online i don't really have that because i don't pr uh, put lectures online or anything of mm -hmm. the sort so it's just the courses <clears throat> at university it's kind of similar because eventually the professors are overwhelmed with research and and right. uh, service work etc so is is it something similar have have you gone through that and how so i was just thinking you know how can professors and educators in general kind of establish something common uh as as the comedians uh, have to yeah, test yeah. out new materials Right. I don't know, like something along the lines. So now, I don't know if, if bands do uh, like they might not end up going to uh, clubs to, to play new material. But it's it's curious, no, like there is no space where people would un would know that they they would join you just like the comedy clubs. Right. Yeah. Knowing that you're working out new material and testing out new material. So they would then call you and say, oh, you're shit or whatever. Or this is so it's it's more like, you know, the middle ground where. Yeah. Will this stick? Will this not, etc. I think that with online classes, there is one opportunity because of the very structure that you have. Now, you know, I know that your classes, I haven't actually looked at all of, all of the classes that you have, but you do synchronous classes where you're meeting at particular times and there's perhaps less room for it there because you're, in this case, your audience or rather your students have signed up because they want this stuff that you've you've promised them. I mean, you can also say, hey, we're going to do an experimental seminar. We're going to try out some new stuff here. I don't know how well this is going to work, but that's a whole different ball game. But when you have like an online platform, even if you're teaching face to face classes, but you have a course management system, if you wanted to try out in small quantities, something new, you can like shoot a video or, or record, you know, a podcast or produce some, some other resources and put it in there as something supplemental and then say, Hey, you know, take a look at this, see what you think. Give me some feedback. Uh, be honest. Is it good? Does it suck? You know? Um, and it, but it would be something supplemental. And then if it is good, then you could say, okay, next, next time around, I, I incorporate this, but I, I will admit <laughs> That I am a when it comes to academic classes, I'm often just a couple steps ahead of the students. So, you know, for example, I've I've been lucky. Marquette University hired me back to teach this upper level core class required for juniors and seniors. And it's got this very long name that nobody actually really follows called uh, Service of Faith and Promotion of Justice. And it's supposed to be some sort of problem-oriented thing. So some people will do like homelessness or debt or, you know, faith and reason. And I, I chose to pick anger because I do so much work on, on anger. And I, you know, so I needed like a textbook to anchor it. And so I took Martha Nussbaum's Anger and Forgiveness, which, you know, if I had to rate it, it it'd get like a three out of five stars. It's not, it's not a great book, but it's not terrible. And it works for, for a classroom. And then I supplemented it with all sorts of other stuff. Sometimes I had, you know, resources on it. Sometimes I had to create them. So like um, it was, you know, I'd, I'd read before um, Joseph Butler, who's got these great sermons about resentment and forgiveness, but I'd never actually produced any resources on it. So last fall, I recorded, I think about eight lectures, eight video lectures on it as, and I, I was talking about it in class too, but these are supplemental for my students. And then, you know, there was, there was quite a bit of other stuff like Lactantius on the anger of God or Aristotle's stuff in rhetoric book too. And so I would just produce these, these resources and um, teach it to my, my students. And then I've got, more stuff in the catalog that I can use. So it's sort of like a comedian testing out stuff or a band saying, hey, we're going to do this this uh, song, you know, it, that's not normally in our set list. Check it out. Um, and I can get away with doing that. You know? Whereas I think at some schools, maybe they wouldn't like you doing that. You know, they want you to kind of stick to what you're, you're, you're doing. 
Yeah, and uh, and this is maybe the reason why also, um, like the, it's in in your case, it's consistency and persistence, and you 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 keep on just producing new content <laughs> on YouTube. Like it's it's amazing yeah. to be honest. Like you and you always renew yourself. Like you have uh, lectures and series on a spectrum of philosophers, right? From ancient, uh, contemporary yeah. almost. So I think this, this also, uh, is one reason why you can avoid stagnation and, and continue to, yeah, to grow. I, I, I'm interested in all sorts of things. Now there is a flip side problem to that, namely Which that is. you don't, you don't buckle down and specialize and just focus on this. Actually, there's two flip side problems. So, so the one is, you know, if you're spreading yourself wide, you're probably thinner than somebody who just does Aristotle and just does Aristotle's metaphysics, right? Or um, just sticks to the Stoics. The other problem that I've run into, and this might also be a problem for you because you've got, you know, fairly diverse interests, is people get to know you as the guy who does this and they don't realize that you do this other thing over there. So, for example, the half hour Hegel project, which is, you know, it's great. I'm almost done with it. I'll be happy when I'm finished. Um, it, I think it's a, a useful resource for a lot of people. There's a ton of people out there who think that I'm just a Hegel guy. And then they'll see me doing something on Aristotle or the Stoics or Christian thinkers. And they'll be like, what is this? I can't believe that he's deviating from, you know, this thing over here. Same thing with, you know, the people who know me for the Stoicism stuff or St. Anselm stuff or pick whatever else you want. Or And then they'll see things like me talking about heavy metal or speculative fiction. And sometimes they're almost like offended, you know. Why are you going outside of your your little box, you know? And and other times they're they're cool with it, but they're like, well, he must be a dilettante, you know, because he's doing the Hegel thing over here. How could he possibly know anything about this this topic over here? Which is quite <laughs> curious. Like I, yeah, it's uh, it's something I I don't think I I experienced the same problem as as you because I I made it clear uh outright that i am an entertainer so and i i don't okay philosophy i i entertain so yeah yeah uh, those who sign up for my courses know what they're signing uh up for but in your case you're actually kind of, well you know the hegel uh series or or stoicism or the series on on anger which we can come back to uh afterwards because i used to be angry and then i decided to read philosophy uh, oh, I, I saw that. Those, you, those you, you, and... You've got a sequence of tweets that are really good about that. <laughs> yeah, I. But the, the 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 latest one is is kind of half like they're always half kind of uh, true and half just made up, you know, with a bridge. Yeah, yeah. Thing. But uh, but yes. So um, and you like is it is it a a bad thing or a good thing? Like, do you consider yourself a specialist in a particular philosophy, philosopher, school of thought? And is this uh, is is this how it should be, or is this a good thing? Bad? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I tell people I'm an eclectic, right? And then people automatically assume that you're just doing like a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this. But I'm an eclectic in the way that Cicero, who I I greatly admire, was an eclectic. He officially did tie himself to a particular school. The Plato's Academy, which by that time had taken a skeptical turn. But the way in which he understood um, that skeptical turn was you could be like a hardcore skeptic and be like, hey, nobody knows anything. You put up an argument, I'll knock it down. Or you could be the kind of person who'd be probabilistic. You'd say, well, I think the Stoics probably have this stuff right. I'm not going to embrace their whole system. Like, you know, for example, he thought divinity was nonsense and there's good arguments against it, even though the Stoics kind of like that. But when it came to the ethics, he was willing to take a lot of stuff from them. And then he would take other things from the academics. And he'd even, you know, on occasion say that the Epicureans had something right. So, um, well, and you know, the Aristotelians too, he, he was he was a big fan of them. So I'm like that, but obviously in the present, we have way more choices than Cicero had. So, I can, you know, I, I don't, I can say that I'm a specialist, but I'm not like at the top tier for any of the things that I specialize in. 
So I, you know, I can talk meaningfully about Aristotle. There's certain texts that I wouldn't like try to present myself as an expert on like parts of animals or the, you know, prior and posterior analytics. And there's definitely people who know way more than me about, you know, the rhetoric or the Nicomachean ethics or the politics, but, you know, I can do a pretty good job with it, certainly well enough to bring something interesting to the table. And similarly there, you know, like when studying St. Anselm, who's the person I've actually published the most about, um, there's definitely St. Anselm scholars who are far better versed in his text than I am. Uh, but, you know, I'm not a slouch. I, I like to say this too about Stoicism. There's a lot of people out there who label themselves as Stoics. It's probably the biggest, you know, contemporary um, ancient philosophy, modern times movement. And a lot of them don't actually know much about Stoicism. It's like they just are happy to be on a team and they're they're beginners or at the beginner slash intermediate level. And I don't call myself a Stoic, but I probably know more about Stoicism and have incorporated more than the people who actually label themselves as Stoics when they really should call themselves like Stoics with training wheels or Stoic beginners. Um, now, you know, when it comes to like the experts in the field, do I know as much about any Hellenistic philosophy as Chris Gill does? No, he's he's like, you know, levels above me, you know, or uh, Julia Annas or, you know, people, people like that. No, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, at an intermediary level, but it, it, you know, I guess one of the cool things about that is that's not nothing, right? So you don't have to be at the absolutely highest level to get a lot out of studying philosophy, you know? Uh, and and if you want to uh, become a specialist in a particular school of thought, philosophy, or a philosopher's work, you'll have to really dedicate all your life to that. And you'll have that's to one of the problems. Everything about or that has been published or will be published, or you know, digging yeah. in the archives, and you just spend your life. It it, it reminds me of Sartre's uh, nausea. Uh, okay. You know, like, oh, uh, right. The Roquentin character. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and him, uh, the, yeah, the Antoine Roquentin. Yeah, exactly. So the guy, you know, spends his days at the archives, uh, trying to write a, a chronicle or a bio of, of this historical figure. And then he's like, what am I doing? Spending my time like this? It's not that this is yeah, good yeah. or bad, but then if, if it's, if it's not, are you, is this something you're interested in? You know, I never really thought about this, but that has to be based, if not on a particular real life person, at least like Sartre's experience of his contemporaries, just yeah. as much as the age of reason uh, incorporates Sartre as, you know, this kind of yeah, yeah, and play fast so, and loose university professor. <laughs> uh, which is again, like they and, and Brian McGee says something about, about this. Uh, uh, you're probably familiar with McGee. I don't know if, uh, if you are sort of, yeah. 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 It's just, uh, he, he was like, yeah, scholars are, are really good, but this is not for me. I prefer, you know, <laughs> being just, uh, being an eclectic as, as you called it. And, uh, I'm more interested in his case and in popularizing philosophy and yeah. you know, just getting people engaged. Um, and and you kind of combine both. I'm assuming you have so in, in the courses that you give and afterwards I I'll I'll jump into Unamuno because I don't yeah. want to talk about him uh, a bit. Um, in your courses, uh, you you mentioned at university you have uh, like more a upper level course but have you also taught like seminars and hardcore stuff that specialize in one particular uh philosopher because i, th I oh. from what i see you combine both kind of right yeah you're, on the one hand you're popularizing for those who are interested and then you do the other uh, bit yeah i mean i in academic um positions I've only rarely gotten to teach a course that's specifically on one thinker. And as a matter of fact, the only one that I've done recently 
is not on a philosopher, although I would say she's very philosophical. It's, it's Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea novels and short stories. Um, at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, I, I was able to teach. I you have to propose your classes, and then they they say yes or no. And so um, I proposed a class, which would be about all the six books of Earthsea, and it got approved. Um, but that's that's more literature than than straight out philosophy. Um, in the past, when I was in my first teaching position which was at Indiana State Prison in this uh, um, extended education program that now no longer exists, unfortunately. I was expected to teach like the whole curriculum. Okay. I, I was, uh, well, so uh, I, Indiana- I, I did, uh, I, I th like I've, I've come across this in, in yeah. one of your previous videos, but yeah, I'm, I'm more curious because you, you well, did talk about this. So Ball State University, was at one time one of the nation, one of the United States uh, leaders in prison education. There were over a hundred professors from Ball State, full-time professors who are teaching in the prisons in Indiana. And it was always a bit unpopular with the taxpayers because, you know, they were like, why do these these you know criminals? Why why are we spending money on them? But it, it you know, if you think about it economically. It's a great way to keep people out of prison because when you when you earn a degree in prison, which is a lot of work and it's much more difficult than doing it at a regular uh, educational institution, the rates that we call them recidivism rates of people going back to prison after they're released, they go down just dramatically. They did a study at one time <clears throat> and they found that with no post-secondary education, it was about 66%. So two out of three guys who got out of the prison would go back to the prison within five years. With uh, an associate's two-year degree, it went down to 12%. And with a bachelor's, it went down to 6%. So from 66% down to 6%. And then they buried the study because they didn't want anyone to see it because they want people to stay in prison. You know, that's, that's job security. Whoa. But yeah. in any case... Um, that's my interesting, fr nonetheless. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, that's just like the economic argument. And you, when you actually teach in prison and you see these prisoners learning things within their history and uh, philosophy and literature classes and then applying them to their life to change who they are, that's pretty amazing stuff. Um, but the taxpayers were always like, screw these guys, you know. And so when the the economic crisis hit in 2007 and 2008, they they closed down the program. And uh, then I had to find another job. But um, while I was there, I was one of two people who taught philosophy and religious studies classes. And the other guy who taught them taught at other prisons. And I only taught at that prison. So I would teach five, four or five or six classes per semester there with these guys. And you know we needed to cover everything everything you would need in order to do a major in philosophy. So I got to teach ancient and um, modern philosophy and contemporary philosophy and do seminars sometimes, you know, like on existentialism, which was always very popular with them. And so it was, uh, it was, it was quite good. And um, I don't get much opportunity to do that sort of stuff anymore um, in part because I'm mostly teaching as an adjunct um, for institutions that are hiring me to teach, you know, like introduction to philosophy or ethics or things along those lines, which which I love doing. Um, but you don't get to specialize just in, we're only going to look at at this author or this school of, of authors. Yeah. and uh, but, but I can do that in my, my spare time, right? Precisely. So you're either way, you're you're kind of doing it and yeah um, you mentioned existentialism and uh, that's a good reason, inroad to uno mono right uh exactly because you uh, one of one of the courses that is actually quite popular is is existentialism and incidentally today i published uh a an article about uh my three years journey because i took the twitter in may 2020 okay tweeting you know i'm gonna so i i thought uh, there was an economic crisis in, in Lebanon. My, my salary was peanuts. 
and mm. uh, I couldn't pay the rent anymore. So I needed to find something else to complement this. And there, then there was the pandemic, of course, and lockdown, uh, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So I was like, <clears throat> let me, let me try my luck. Uh, I'll, I'll post something on, on Twitter, see if, uh, if people would be interested. And so I chose because I thought it would be popular existentialism and literature. Okay. And, uh, it was again, a strike of luck, just like you said, 40 people ended up signing up. I did not have a page. I did not have a payment gateway. I, I did not have anything. So the first yeah. tweet I, I posted somehow people got interested. So I was reflecting on this, uh, today, like it was three, exactly almost three years ago. I published the tweet on May 11th today, we're May 24. And, uh, in June we started existentialism literature. So it's usually popular because it relates to like it, it, uh, existentialism as a movement focuses on human beings as right. Yeah. As, as a subject of flesh and bone, as, as Unamuno would, uh, would say, right. But yeah. then usually when I say existentialism, uh, or if not existentialism, if people are not familiar with, with the term, you say Sartre, Camus, uh, and precursors of existentialism, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, you've, people have heard about these authors, right? Right. Yeah. But then you mention Miguel de Unamuno and no one know who that guy is, at least yeah. now he was very yeah. popular back in the day. And his dates are 1864, 1936, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, yeah. Why? I would, you know, I would say there's, there's a couple other people too in the existentialist, let's call them no, of course, of course. umbrella yeah. that, that are like that, like, uh, Lev Shestov, who I think is, you know, he and, and Unamuno are kind of covering similar I don't ground, know who that right? Guy is. Oh, he's, he's, he's really fun, uh, to read. Um, Lev if you like Shestov. Unamuno, you will, you will like him. He was a Russian guy uh, from a Jewish family, fled after the revolution to Paris, where you know so many Russians went to. And he was, um, he, I, I call him a second generation, and I include Unamuno in that as well, um, existentialist, where they're, they're starting to see the connections between, as you call them, precursors like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and, and these guys, and then they're doing their own cool thing. Um, so I, I think there's quite a few people that yeah. the quite popular... Same, same dates, almost 1866, yeah, 1938. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they live different lives, of course, right? One one comes from one end of the continent, the other comes from the other end of the continent. But there's kind of a shared, what would you call it? It's... it's, it's uh, I, I don't even want to say culture. I would say a civilization comprised of many cultures that they can participate in. And so the same, well, you, like you were saying, you know, existentialism focuses on the human being existing in, in real life situations. That's another thing that makes it quite attractive because you don't have to like only do it at Oxford or Paris or places like that. You know, you can do it here in Milwaukee or in Salamanca or pick wherever else you want to. Right. Um, but yeah, there's, there's all these interesting figures who have kind of dropped out of, we could call it the mythology of existentialism. Um, you know, think about Lou Andrea Salome too, you know, uh, she's kind of an interesting bridge figure between Nietzsche and Rilke. And she also studied with Freud and writes some interesting things of her own, but hardly anybody ever talks about her anymore, you know? Yeah. So, so, but yeah, Uno, Uno, I, I was really fortunate in that when I was an undergraduate studying philosophy, and there weren't many people doing that where I was studying it, there was a guy from Spain. And he was another student, right? And he was like, I think maybe a year ahead of me. His name was David, and I forget his his last name, but typically Spanish, it was a hyphenated last name. Um, and so he would he he wouldn't shut up about the guy. I think out of national pride. <laughs> you know? So we're taking this contemporary philosophy class, and like every class session, he would be like, "And Uno Muno says." And so after a while, I was like, "Well, who's this Uno Muno guy?" <laughs> <laughs> the, this is this is the annoying type of students in in class, no. But it's it's curious yeah. that he, he wouldn't shut up about Unamuno, 
uh when are we when, when is that I don't so this would have remember. been this would have been in the 90s early 90s, 90s. when i was a, a undergraduate yeah. and i didn't you know at, at that time i didn't actually read unamuno but i sort of tucked it in the back of my head and then i saw other references to him and i was like i should probably read this guy and so you know i i got tragic oh you can't actually see it because of the the zoom thing tragic sense of life and read that and you know read a few other things and then i was like you know i could actually teach this stuff in existentialism class and the students would have because uh, the, the the tendency is to teach existentialism so you get like here's the granddaddies kierkegaard dostoevsky nietzsche right on one end and then you know maybe we'll talk a little bit about heidegger and we'll read a little bit of rilke and then we get the frenchies and the frenchies are basically just sartre who kind of took over the the title uh camus as you mentioned, uh, de Beauvoir, and then they typically leave out Gabriel Marcel or, or other existentialists who were a big, big deal at the time. Um, and there's all this other stuff missing in the middle. And Unamuno was, he should be in the top rank in that missing stuff because a Tragic Sense of Life is such a great book, you know, and it's so relatable. I, I, I won't, I won't speak for you, but when I read it or I read people like Shestoff, I'm like, wow, this guy's, you know, I don't agree with him on everything, but he's certainly got some interesting thoughts. And there's like real philosophical rigor here without losing the sense of like personal involvement and commitment. And I like the fact that he's, he doesn't have to have everything neatly worked out. He's willing to leave some things and say, oh, this is as far as we got, you know, uh, figure it out on your own at, after, at this point. This is this is part of the criticism uh, addressed yeah. at uh, Unamuno. It's like he he doesn't have a philosophical system. So many people yeah. don't even look at him as a philosopher because like why what you're talking about is just maybe something like Nietzsche, right? Like the, some uh, and yeah, yeah. philosophers and others they would look at Nietzsche as a literature guy. Uh, and similarly yeah. for in, in the case of Unamuno, but. Um, for for those of uh, for those listening uh, to us and uh, they don't know absolutely anything about Unamuno, uh, I did uh, teach Unamuno in one of my existentialism courses online. So it was yeah yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was who's who's the uh, who's the Romanian Romanian I think guy. Um, oh, are you thinking about Chiran? Uh, yeah, Emil Emil Chiran. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, we did. I did not teach like uh, Philippe, uh, my uh, the co-teacher, uh, taught taught that. And we did Unamuno and uh, Najib Mahfouz. And we did one more uh, guy. I forgot. It was Philippe's. I think. I think he did. Do we did this Dostoevsky, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. 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 But uh, but yeah. So how would you? Uh, so someone on the street knows absolutely nothing about Unamuno or or his philosophy yeah how would you how would you uh hook them with with uh, with what he has to say you know I think that phrase that you brought up before about um it's it's philosophy for the the human being who is of flesh and bone and blood that's key um, Unamuno, I mean, he can, he can, if he wants to, he can talk in very theoretical terms about what these people are doing at a kind of high level, but he's always coming back to uh, the human being and what's really distinct about them. Their rationality is rooted in the actual human subject who isn't just an individual, but exists in relation to others. And um, yeah, I mean, he talks about reason as being a social thing rather than being like this thing that we've got like tucked away in our head. And so you philosophize as a living, breathing person with the concerns that you have from the problems and vantage points and opportunities that you have right here, right now. I mean, if he were living today, he would be on the internet and talking and speculating about what it's doing to us. And he'd probably be shooting videos and have a podcast. <laughs> yeah. So I think maybe that's one appeal, but you could also, you could also highlight that, that absolutely key theme, tragic sense of life. Why is it tragic? Because we have to die. 
And we really do live nowadays, at least here in America, and I would say probably through much of the developed world in in a culture that tries to insulate us as much as possible from from seeing death. You know, I mean, this is going to be like from way out field, but you could think about it analogous to like um, the four sites that the Buddha encounters before he's the Buddha. You know, um, he's got what we would nowadays call helicopter parents who have a lot of resources and they don't want him to be bothered by stuff, you know, so he doesn't get to see any old people or sick people or, um, you know, corpses or anything like that. And um, Uno Muno says, no, no, we need to see that sort of thing. We need to think about that because we are going to die and we can't, we can't afford to have this kind of, imaginary oh we're going to a better place sort of thing we should actually like think about what it's going to be like when we're gone are we going to somewhere else or is this it you know and he 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 realizes that within all of us and this is another thing i really love about the work there are these desires and demands on our part for what might not actually be the case like maybe there's a god maybe there isn't you know but we sure as hell want there to be one at least some, you know, image of it. And we, we sure do want to live on. And I, I think a lot of people can relate to that, you know? Yeah. The, he, so this, uh, you, you, before, before I discuss this, uh, briefly, yeah. is, is there this tendency to kind of sh put death away or try is, is it really, are we, are we trying to do that? Is this how, because I, I have come yeah. across this uh, sometimes when, when I'm teaching and then I I find it kind of curious that people, I don't know if it's if it's in the culture or if it's just uh, people are trying to forget about death. And this is the, like, yeah. yeah, I don't know, the tragic sense of life in the sense that we are going to be dying. Our, we, we do have a lot of cultural depictions in the stuff that um, the ancient Greeks would have called poetry and we call film, television, podcast, drama, pick, pick, uh, video games, right? But it's usually, um, it's usually sanitized. You know, you can, you can watch shows where dozens of people are dying, but it doesn't actually like linger over them. And, you know, you're seeing, as they say, the lights go out in somebody's eyes and an entire world being dissolved or destroyed, let alone what the effects are on their family, you know, and not just as they go to the funeral, but six months later, a year later, you know, the, the, the missing person. I mean, there are some there are some cultural products, you know, some films, some television shows that do, in fact, do that well, but I would say 99% of them don't. If death is depicted, it's usually in the middle of conflict, right? And it's as it's it's you know the 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 main characters they don't die. They've got plot armor, and everybody else is dying around them, um, or you know somebody close to them is killed by the antagonist, and then they have to go get revenge. But we don't we don't get an awful lot of like let's call it real engagement with with death it's always abstract at least maybe un unless someone close goes through you know uh, yeah. a situation circumstance illness and then they might pass away like there is no actual maybe war and the reason why i'm bringing this up is because curiously again uh, my the first kind of course uh, a philosophy course ever i took was existentialism in literature uh mm. 2007 Okay. And and I wrote an article about this because for me, the reason why I went into philosophy uh, or there there are two reasons why I went into philosophy after I finished my BS in, in business or BBA, BBA, whatever it's called. Uh, yeah. One, because of the uh, the financial crisis, no one understood what was going on. And so I was like, if, if you guys cannot give me the answers, what am I doing here? And this is <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. Like the, and the other reason is uh, war. Uh, the living in Lebanon at particularly yep. like I'm, I'm aware of so many episodes of war, but the 2006 one was I'm, I'm 16 years old or 15. I forgot, uh, 16, I think 17. 
2006, I was, no, I was 17. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're perceiving death. It's, it's right around the corner and everything, right, is, right. you know, buildings are being bombarded. So it, it got me, this is, this is where, yeah, the tragic sense of life is like death is there. Uh, my, my grandpa had died before when I was young, but it, it did not have the same effect, old age, etc. You know, it's, it's not the same, but here it's, you're living it, you're experiencing, you, you might die. Uh, at any moment in time, my grandma's house, for example, was uh, bombarded. You know, uh, bombarded as well, yeah. uh, raced to the ground. So it's it got me to think about philosophy and death. And this is why existentialism uh, uh, kind of resonated with me. In the case of Unamuno, it was in fact his son. Maybe this this is the, this is the crisis that he had reconciling reason and 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 faith because he wanted to believe in a god but then you cannot yeah. really know whether or not there's a god his son raimundo i think he was called uh, had an illness and he passed away a year after he was born uh maybe less maybe more i don't know and this kind of got him to think about in this sense the tragic sense of life and it's, it's yeah and, and i would say one other thing too about so it's a it's a great title and it does he you know in the very introduction he says i'm going to be talking about this tragic sense of life and so you might think oh it's going to be a big downer right but it's not you know because there's also plenty of we could say comedy within it comedy in the old sense where you know when aristotle talks about tragedy and comedy tragedy is about um very high level people you know, they've got great power and virtue and they give these wonderful speeches. And then comedy is like you and me, ordinary people who, um, you know, have to figure, you know, sometimes when they, we often say people, everyone puts their pants on the same way, you know, one leg at a time. But comedy is when you're trying to put your foot through the pants and it gets stuck halfway through because you got big feet and then you like trip a little bit, right? That happens to all of us. And it, yeah. maybe not pants, but <laughs> something else. Else. And I think there's a good bit of that in here as well. And you could say it's it's a understanding of contingency. Um that and some of us are going to have children who who die young. Um I, I hope I won't be because I've got two kids myself. Um but you know, you you have these contingent events that happen and then you have to figure out what you're going to what you're gonna make of them. Um are you are you going to so let's say you do have somebody close to you die um when you're standing in the funeral line um and people come up to you and they say silly things like oh they're in heaven looking down at you now you know i'm sure i'm sure they're uh in a better place what do you do you know uh do you say oh yes i'm i'm sure that's the case and lie about it or actually when my mother died i i I'll tell you this story. It's a little bit long, but you may get a kick out of it. So when my mom died, she was a very, very vivacious person, made friends everywhere. And she happened to be the secretary of this club that she was in, which unfortunately had thousands of people. And so when she died and we were at the funeral, it's me and my, um, at that time, girlfriend and my sister and her boyfriend and a few, you know, like my grandfather and grandmother and a few other family members. And we're all dressed in black, typical sort of thing. And the funeral line, uh, it took six hours for all of them to come through because she had about 100 people from her work show up. And then my family was very large. So we had about 200 people from my family. And then there were at least a thousand people from this club, you know, and they would, you know, they would say weird, wacky stuff like that. Like, oh, you know, she's got her wings. She's an angel now. And after a while, I got a little fed up and I'd say, for all we know, she could be down in hell. You know, I mean, she didn't die uh, <laughs> reconciled with the church. Where are you getting all this silly nonsense from? And, you know, it's just as likely as as the other. Um, and you know, there was sort of an absurdity to it, this need to, I don't know, put comforting labels on, you know, something that we can all relate to as human beings. I mean, we all are going to die. Everybody through history has died. It's not like we're special or that the destination for our bodies or spirits um, is, you know, 
tailor made for for you and me and our generation. Um, it, we're all we're all in the same boat, you could say. Yeah. Now, come. To I mean, co- about it. yeah. I think COVID kind of brought that home to the people who were willing to look at it starkly and not pretend that it wasn't a real disease. You know, it's kind of a shock yeah. to to many. Uh, and this is this is also maybe why existentialism in, in literature resonated three years ago. And, yeah. But now, now come to think about it, and we can we can maybe tie this to Unamuno. Maybe the reason why they they share these comforting kind of words is not because they are directing them at you, but at themselves because right. of this yes. uh, longing for immortality. Uh, Unamuno talks about. <clears throat> yeah, that would but, be putting the best sort of sense on it. That that they've yeah. got a they've got the same desire that we all have, and it's just, just kind of misguided into these easy superficial available cultural concepts you know because unamuno's struggle was also <clears throat> maybe something along the lines of uh, uh you know the, this uh, socrates i'm i'm thinking now uh diotima but this like okay i'm gonna die yeah uh, but i really 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 want to live and the tragic yeah. sense of life and the sense that this is gonna end and so what do i do uh, because yeah. I usually get these these questions, right? And uh, how how would you like what what would you say about this? How do I create value? Do I look for meaning? Do I uh, write a book because this might be make me immortal? How how mm. does maybe Unamuno? And what would what do you think about about it's like, it's how interesting. We this? I mean, you brought up Diotima, so let's let's actually use the symposium and the several different levels that she talks about. So there is the those who are pregnant in their body and they go and look for somebody that they can have sex with and make little babies and the babies are going to be their immortality. But kids never turn out the way that you expect. You know, I, I have two kids. Neither of them are particularly interested in philosophy. And that's fine because at their age neither neither was i necessarily you know um when i was a a a student i was uh i i was reading philosophy but also partying a lot and you know um doing other things too (laughs) so so maybe they'll come back doing philosophy in a different way exactly yeah yeah And, and you so you cannot count on your kids being little yous that are going to continue on whatever project your your life is about. And if you try to make them that way, you just make them miserable and you make yourself miserable, you know? So what if we do think about like writing a great book? You know, he um, Plato has Diotima talk about those who are pregnant in the soul and they, they produce, you know, like Homer and I forget who else. She, she might bring up Hesiod as these great poets who produce something cool. Okay, so maybe maybe I write a book or maybe you write a book. But, you know, there's no guarantee that people are actually going to be reading it 100 years from now and understanding it. I mean, to take Unamuno, it's, it's great that his stuff is still in print and we can read it and be like, holy shit, this is really good stuff, right? Um, but he could have easily have slipped through the cracks and and just totally disappeared. So what about if we go to a higher level for Plato, those who form institutions, those who set up the laws for things? Well, if you can actually get people to let you do that, that's great too. But when it comes to most of the features of our contemporary life, we don't think about the people who you know, made the roads go the way that they go or created our legal systems or, you know, we hear about some of them, a very limited few, but the viewpoint that we have on them is you know, just a tiny little keyhole into who they they were. And so none of these are really great ways to make yourself immortal. And you probably can't make yourself immortal in any lasting sense. The best you can do is to Put your stuff out there and, you know, have tried to live a rich life that's engaged with other human beings. So you make their lives a bit more interesting or better or less screwed up. And then you're gone, you know, but that doesn't mean that it, it's meaningless or that um, it doesn't have any value, you know. 
this is this is i think what what some uh some of the students struggle with like there is uh, yeah if, i think i think is, you're right if yeah. this is nihilism or if if you're saying that okay we cannot know whether there's a god or whether there's a reason where that would allow us to access some sort of truth what are we left with and uh, right. i always have the same discussions like are we creating that you know you get the sense of are we creating values are we discovering these values how are we going to be living uh what if i decide to go yolo but then i have like moral responsibility to others and and yeah, so yeah. Many things right this is this is what uh what some students or at least this is what students associate nihilism with and i'm like no no it's not that there's no values, then we can do whatever we want. It's just that we're they're acknowledging that there is no kind of a, a, a preset right. Uh, right. values that we have to follow. And but this is why we're here, because we're we're here to kind of think about things and come up with it's it's tricky, not our own values as such, but or our values, knowing that we are social animals and we have moral responsibility to others. Know right. Something that that that's certainly part of it. And then you can say that you can, as an individual, also give your own experience its due. So, you know, going out, for example, you know, I'll, I'll take a walk later on today, uh, probably down by the Menominee River, which is, you know, kind of a canal here in, in Milwaukee. And I'll look and see what's growing because it's springtime. And so I'll see the shoots coming up and there'll be a few flowers, but not a lot of flowers. I, I really like flowers, you know, and um, I'll, I'll look at the stuff and I'll observe the seagulls landing and doing their thing. There's probably geese and ducks and things like that. And you can say, well, who gives a crap, right? That's all just a, a meaningless world full of these animals and plants that are doing purely mechanistic things. And you can say, yeah, but I can still appreciate it, you know, and it doesn't have to be like this grand scheme of things. And, and if somebody else wants to come along with me and appreciate it, um, even though they won't see exactly the same thing as I do, and maybe they're distracted a little bit, um, it's still worth doing. Or, you know, I can at least decide whether it's worth doing or not, and they can decide. And if I want to write a poem about it later, you know, I'm not a good poet, but I could do that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and somebody gets something out of, you know, my observing the goose's wing or something like that. that that's not nothing, right? It's just not, as you put it, the, the, this top level thing. And, you know, we can live a perfectly good existence that is full of all of these little interesting moments that we often share with other people. And then, you know, there's like, you know, some other things that you mentioned, our social nature, Um we have our responsibilities, you know, um, and living those out that that can be a fully meaningful life, even if everything else is screwed up around you. You know, as you mentioned, it being being in Lebanon, um, Lebanon is always sort of like in a, a duly precarious situation because you have the internal conflict that's seemingly never ended. Right. And then you've got all the other neighboring countries around who are doing their own thing, which affect this tiny little island that, I mean, it's not a literal island, but it's kind of a culturally an island, Lebanon, right? So if Syria goes to crap, well, that's going to have effects on Lebanon. If Turkey starts to get uh, antsy about what's going on in Syria or, you know, about the Kurds, then that affects Lebanon too, you know? What is, I, you know, Iran going to do in terms of, uh, you know, supporting or not supporting uh, the Shia there? Well, you know, you're, you're just stuck with it, right? But it doesn't mean that, sitting with a friend and, you know, um, having a conversation becomes valueless because it could be taken away from you because of what other people do um, that you have zero control over, you know? And this is kind of where like stoicism and existentialism, they're not the same thing, but they do overlap to some degree, you know? And I like that Unamuno, you know, one of the people he brings up, Marcus Aurelius, you know? Yeah, and, and this is uh, actually, and and we can and uh, here this is this is how Unamuno lived his life, 
he mm. had this crisis oh, right yeah and but but despite all that when he was in in salamanca he he always loved to uh, go hiking and to uh, visit new cities so he traveled around uh, quite a lot uh even when he was uh well they they exiled him at one point but that's that's besides the yeah. fact. uh philosophically speaking like he loved to go on hikes he would go uh, he would frequent uh, the cafes cafe noelti and and the plaza mayor and he would have discussions with his friends and with the professors so he was like the when 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 i usually describe a philosopher everyone's thinking you know behind the desk and yeah. and thinking all day and then this guy was more of a theatrical person as you said he would have been on twitter today and trolling everyone around and <laughs> uh making uh claims about so many things just just because that's how just to provoke things. yeah uh, yeah prov provoking people and uh, but but educating at the same time which is quite interesting and he got in yeah. because of that we don't know whether or not he he was assassinated or he died mm. of natural causes but yeah, eventually this is what you have, kind of. Uh, you just, as as you said, appreciate, try as much as possible to appreciate life and focus on what you can control. And this is where stoicism uh, would come in. And if you ever are angry, try reading philosophy. <laughs> but then, I don't know, you start reading Hegel and you're like, fuck this shit, I'm out of here. Uh, and you become angrier. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. So I, you know, when I was an undergraduate, one of my professors was actually a German guy who had lived through the Second World War as a kid. And then he he got the hell out of there as quick as he could to, to, to the United States. And he used, he hated Hegel. Um, and he would say that whenever he needed to get to sleep and he couldn't fall asleep, he would get Hegel's logic off of his uh, nightstand and just start reading it. And within a page, he would immediately fall asleep because you know, it's just, just wow. so, so abstract and boring, you know? Yeah, which is kind of, I mean, uh, your your series is, I think you're at the phenomen phenomenology of spirit. Are you doing That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which is equally, uh, I don't know. Abstract. Boring. Yes. And abstract. I But yes, it's, it's very difficult uh, to read. Uh, so yeah, the, you're doing a great job with Hegel. <laughs> Good on you. But uh, I, I, I don't know. Like I would listen, I would watch your videos, but I, I don't think I will ever read hegel ever again it's it's just too too tough too tough you know uh, i'll tell i'll tell you something that's sort of like appealing the curtain back that maybe some of your listeners or viewers might get a kick out of and i think it could also be encouraging so when i'm going to produce a half hour hegel video i'm reading through the entire section and then reading the particular paragraph or paragraphs that I'm going to work on. And I've got my chalkboard and I'll like diagram some stuff out that I'll use um, in part to guide my own thinking, but also so that there's something visual. And some days I can do it and other days I can't. After putting in all that work, I can have the lights on and the camera and have like my lapel mic and I've got everything on the chalkboard and I've just reread the paragraph and I'll get there and I'll be like, oh, I don't know what I want to say. I I lost the train of thought. And that, that happens more often with Hegel than say with Marcus Aurelius, who's who's easier, you know, or, or Unamuno. But it has happened with other philosophers. So what people what people often see are our successes the products that made it right they don't see all of the starting off getting a minute into it and being like oh i got to do another take or just walking away from it all together and so you know it's similar with books we read these authors books and we're like holy shit, these people are smart you know way smarter than i am we don't see the the nights where they like threw away 50 pages and they're like, this is garbage, you know, and maybe threw away some good stuff. So I, I think it's it's good to keep in mind that what we what we do get to see with these interesting cultural products are just the um, just a facade, just the the good stuff. Yeah. And and uh, the the article I I wrote was called "In Praise of the Process" because that's that's what mm. often goes missing. It's like you, as right. you said, you go through so many things, and and of course you're improving. Like the first time I I, I gave a course ever uh, in 2013 February, I I was shit. <laughs> 
uh, I I might be less shitty now, but then I improved, right? Like if maybe I'm I'm not that good, but it's like there's there's this process, and as you said, like sometimes <laughs> you you try to explain something, and like one day uh, you you explain Hegel phenomenally, and then the other day you you just don't know what uh, what to yeah. say. So I I I'm, totally I, feel you. I'm lucky that I didn't begin recording my lectures at the beginning of my teaching career, but rather it would have been like. 12 or 13 years it because when i first started teaching i was terrible uh that th th this is this is why i almost <laughs> yeah i i still feel not i still don't feel ready to to, to post my like to record lectures separately mm. and just share them right i i do have sample lectures i don't mind sharing my lectures but then i wouldn't present my async courses or okay. lectures as i am doing a good thing here because i i still feel like i've I'm only 10 years in, uh, so I still feel like I can do a lot of improvement. You know, you know what I will say about that, though? Um, you don't have to be great. You just have to be good enough. And the good enough there is not measured by any sort of objective standard. It's measured by whether your students are, after the lecture is over, whether they are better equipped to read whoever it is that you're you're talking about, Yeah. you know? That's uh, that's a uh, good advice. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, and uh, where can people find you? Well, I'm really fortunate in that at this point in time, all you got to do is put into Google Gregory Sadler and all sorts of things are going to come up. So they can find my YouTube channel that way. Uh, if they want to find um, my study with Sadler Academy, just put that into Google and that pops up as well. And it works out uh, quite nicely for me. As I've mentioned in telling other people about this, it really sucks for anybody else who's named Gregory or Greg Sadler because First <laughs> they can't get any traction anymore. Uh, philosophy and yeah. But uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for this. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, um, we'll have you. to do this again sometime. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely. And uh, this was this was fun. Next time it would be about someone else or some other anecdotes, more maybe. Sure. The, the, also the prison experience. I'm 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 curious about. I uh, but uh, but yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you every everyone for uh, listening.